Our next speaker is Dr. Kirsten Buick, professor in the Department of Art at the University of New Mexico. Kirsten. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such an honor uh, to be invited back to the Porter Colloquium. I love Howard University. I'll do anything that you ever need me to do. I'd be happy to. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the colloquium for having me back. And it's good to see Scott and Floyd. Um, so um, I have had cause to think a lot about archives lately, how they are formed, how they are policed, how they become authoritative, etc. But also I think about my own process of keeping mental archives of information that I want to return to later. Over the years, as I worked on the 19th century Ojibwe and African-American sculptor Edmonia Lewis, I have kept an accounting of how her identity or identities as African-American or Native American or as a devout Catholic get operationalized at opportune or opportunistic moments. I also keep an account of historical actors whose self-identifications are ignored or rendered less authoritative because the primacy of the photograph, together with the epidermalization of race, allow them to be read otherwise. This holds true as well for Florence Thompson, who is Cherokee, but who, through the lens of Dorothea Lange, came to stand for a kind of every woman, that is, white, in the era of the Great Depression and for Mildred Loving, whose juridical life has been historically understood as black, but who I, who'd never identified as such, instead claiming to be Indian Rappahannock until her death. When I was asked to present at the Porter Colloquium, I had already been thinking a lot about photographic archives specifically, but also about what anthropologist Ann Stoller conceptualizes as the archival grain, which is a process of appraisal, arrangement, and description. To read against the grain, then, is to consider what kinds of knowledge archival processes have obscured or suppressed. I was in the midst of teaching a new seminar, photographing Jim Crow, 1890 to 1965, and in our first text by Elizabeth Abel, Signs of the Times, the Visual Politics of Jim Crow, she does a stellar job of reading signs and photographs of signs thickly considering how they both organize space as well as race, stating, if we look beyond the cursory language of the signs to their discursive or material surround, and if we take into account the vantage points of viewers who recorded their perceptions and photographs that rework the text textual field, these ball directives begin to seem more complex and malleable tools for race making. And how the signs work to reinforce whiteness as the default norm and as itself without racialization. The semantic configuration of bathroom signs, for example, that designated which facilities were for white ladies and which were for coloreds, thereby denying black women the dignity of their gender. But Abel was also very clear that she considered Jim Crow signs and photographs of signs a distinct and separate archive from lynching photographs. And the picture of the book on the right is uh, The Hanging Bridge. Uh, and it's an excellent account of this bridge in Mississippi, uh, which even at the height of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, when the clarion call for equality and justice echoed around the country, few volunteers ventured into Clark County, Mississippi. Fewer still remained. Clark lay squarely in what many considered Mississippi's and thus America's meanest corner. Local African Americans knew why the movement failed there. Some spoke of a bottomless hole in the, in the snaking Chickasaway River in the town of Shibuda, where white vigilantes had for decades dumped the bodies of murdered African Americans. Others more spoke of a hanging bridge that spanned that same muddy creek. And such spaces are just as much a part of America's la racial landscape as Jim Crow signs. Lynching, like the signs, spell out a geography of race. And yet, Abel's criteria for what, what gets included, how the archive is appraised, arranged, and described, 
is based more on her discomfort, I believe, in dealing with lynching and the various souvenirs that the event produced, preferring instead the bloodless conceptual exercise of Jim Crow signage. Had she assembled her archive honestly, the sites of lynching and the sites of signs, with photos as the indices of both, her discussion about how space is racialized and how race is spatialized would have produced a richer, more productive argument. Instead, she pits what are now two archives, against one another, and then must account for the scarcity of Jim Crow signs relative to the number of lynching photographs that still exist. As, as Francis Bluen and William Rosenberg argue in their book, Processing the Past, Contesting Authority in History and the Archives, history relies for its authenticity on the archive, which in turn provides history with its authoritative base. The interplay between authority and authenticity is an interesting one when we consider how the photographic archive can check and subvert history so that identity, identification, and experience in certain cases are rendered invalid and no longer authoritative. Such is the case with three women whose experiences and identities were grounded in their identification as indigenous. Edmonia Lewis was born around 1845 to a mother who is Ojibwe and a father who is African American. She was raised in her mother's village in upstate New York and was perhaps involved in the family business of selling souvenirs to interested whites around the region of Niagara Falls. As she came to prominence as a sculptor, it was her black heritage that made her of primary interest to abolitionists. In Lewis's case, we have what I would describe as the upending of the upending of English common law, so that Lewis inherits her condition, her racial condition, not from her mother, which was the compromise that English colonists reached with the threat that the offspring of African women and European men would be born free, but instead she would inherit her condition from her father. Lewis's early experience raised among the Ojibwe counted for very little except to polish her exotic gloss. And on the left is, of course, Forever Free in Howard University's collection. And on the right is her sculpture of the old arrow maker and his daughter. Not only were Lewis's photographs in circulation to counter her indigenous identity, various contemporaries described and tried to localize upon her hair and features traits typical of the African and European and the Indian. And as long as her work was of interest to the abolitionist cause, Lewis accommodated those musings, and she rendered them concrete through her sculptures. Lewis created her own archive based on her racial heritages, and yet Forever Free is no more authoritative than Lewis's Indian works based on the fictional Hiawatha. Forever Free was created with the same distance as Hiawatha in that Lewis was never enslaved. She could empathize, but only from a distance. Rather than individual memory, the works exist only as social memory. As Bluen and Rosenberg note, as individual telling becomes the social told, and particular lived or historical experiences are written large, the subjects of individual memory become, in effect, social objects. Unlike Edmonia Lewis, Florence Thompson had no control over her image or her identity. Thompson, under Dorothea Lange's lens, became the social told, a social object. Lange took Thompson's likeness in 1936 as part of Lange's FSA assignment to document the conditions of rural labor in Napomo, California. Neither Roy Stryker, Lang's boss at FSA, nor Lang herself was interested in Indians. Instead, they agreed that Lang would focus on rural whites and their declining status, much like today. And for Lang, who died in 1964, Thompson remained the perfect icon of the New Deal Madonna. Lang was working with her mental archive that told her what a real, authentic Indian looked like, and it wasn't Thompson. It took six de decades for scholars to begin digging for Thompson's identity. And she was there for the asking. She died in 1983. So it always pays to live 
the longest, right? She expressed her irritation and decades-long aggravation over the image that misrepresented her as white rather than as Cherokee, which she was proud to be. Once again, we find a fascinating interplay between the authoritative and the authentic and how one is the basis for the other, reinforcing what political scientist Adolf Reed has said, that the authentic is hortatory rather than descriptive, that it seeks to persuade, persuade rather than describe. And of course, Mark Loving, speaking in 2016, was talking about the upcoming Hollywood film Loving, starring Ruth Nega as Mildred Loving. He insisted that his grandmother would deplore the attention, that she never considered herself an activist, nor did she consider herself black. The Lovings married in 1958, and it took almost a decade for the Supreme Court to overturn Virginia's Racial Integrity Act that rendered the Loving marriage a crime. Mark Loving's proof is found in the archives themselves. His grandparents' uh, marriage license that clearly named Mildred Jeter as Indian. As Bluen and Rosenberg note, archives and the processes of archiving itself connoted authenticity and officialization. Both were at the foundation of an ordered society, end of quote. Moreover, they continue, the nature and scale of what was considered essential documentation naturally evolved with societies themselves. And they named specifically marriage licenses, which became part of how societies defined social organization and conceptualized property. However, according to one of the Loving's lawyers, Bernard Cohen, Mildred Loving only ever identified herself as black to him. And thanks to the work of Erica Coleman, whose article on the Loving family appeared in Time Magazine, Mildred Loving's self-identification as Native American had its roots in Virginia's strict anti-miscegenation laws. She writes, in 1930, legislators fearing that blacks would use the Indian claim to subvert the law restricted the Indian classification to reservation Indians um, in, King, in King Williams County. The nation's oldest reservations were the Pomonke and the Mataponi. Numerous non-reservation citizens claimed an Indian identity, thereby circumventing the restriction uh, uh, for marriage in Washington, D.C., where they were able to obtain marriage licenses with the Indian racial designation. Mildred Loving was no exception, Coleman says. Her racial identity was informed by the deeply entrenched racial politics of her community in Central Point, Virginia. And I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to skip ahead to the last slide. What constitutes authority in each instance? What carries the weight of authenticity? The problem, was, of course, is that once the various archives are authenticated, they then become authoritative. The readers for Abel's book left the question of the possible connection between sites of lynching and sites of Jim Crow signs up to the author. And had I and my students not read against the grain, we would have had a much more comfortable time of it with no images of lynching to look at. In the cases of Lewis, Thompson, and Loving, the photographs to some extent aided in the erasure of their native identities identifications. The photographs flattened the, com the complexity of their histories and their stories and helped to retool them to become the figureheads of abolitionism, the New Deal, and the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you. <laughs>